Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Conservation Conversations. Uh, thank you all for joining us for our first Conservation Conversation of 2021. Uh, we're really excited to be able to bring you uh, this series um, with some interesting topics uh, this year. Um, my name is Ed Pritchard. I work for Miami Eco Adventures. We're a division of Miami-Dade County Parks. Uh, this webinar series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami Eco Adventures. Uh, we will be offering this webinar series again every month uh, on the second Wednesday at noon. Uh, although we can't see you in person, we are excited to offer this again and reach more people than we normally would with our uh, programs. Um, so thanks again for tuning in. Everyone in this uh, webinar is currently muted, so I ask you guys to uh, if you have any questions, to type those in in the chat box. Those will go to me, and I will make sure to address those with our speaker today. Um, we will answer those questions at the end of the session. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so a link to the recording will be sent out um, after the presentation um, in the next few days. Uh, that way you can share that with uh, those that weren't able to join us. Um, we will be announcing uh, our conservation conversation topics on our social media. Um, we already have a date set for February. Um, we'll be uh, talking about manatees. Um, and so that date you can register for and we will provide that link um, and you can register for upcoming dates um, all on one page. Uh, if you'd like to be added to a list where you get those uh, links and information, um, I will put uh, Anna's email in the chat box and you can reach, uh, reach her there and register uh, for those upcoming dates. Um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Anna Zangronis. Uh, take it away, Anna. All right, thank you, Ed, and welcome back, everyone. Welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. Happy New Year, happy 2021. And we're gonna be discussing a little bit today about the lighthouses of Southeast Florida. And since I don't have my camera on, here's what I look like in real life. You know, depends really the, the level of animation depends on the coffee that I've ingested. And I am the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent here in Miami Dade County and a huge, very active boater, mariner, scuba diver, and most recently, lighthouse aficionado. And so before we get started, I want to throw out and just warm you all up a little bit by asking you a question that I'm gonna ask Ed to launch in the polls. Ed's gonna put this poll up on the screen and you simply use your mouse to select whatever answer you think is right. It's anonymous. And I'm asking, what does a ton stand for? Is it A, a ton of nachos, B, all for navigation, C, aid to navigation, or D, aids to night vision. And I figured since it was lunchtime, you know, I would I would tantalize everyone with this really gorgeous photograph of nachos because I mean, who doesn't love nachos? All, All right. right. Thank you got everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for participating everybody. Thanks Ed. And if you chose the letter C, aids to navigation, you are correct. Aids to navigation are integral to boating and ocean life as we know it. And they exist in a number of different shapes and sizes and designs, including what we have here all the way on the left, day markers, as well as different styles and shapes and colors of buoys and the colors and the size and the design are all very important and have a particular role in assisting navigation. And of course, something that I think collectively as a society we all rely upon is a GPS unit, which of course, I mean, speaking for myself, it's pretty handy, whether in the car or on a boat. However, for those who might be a little bit newer to boating or driving, there were these incredible creations called maps, also known as charts. And here on the left is a copy of a nautical chart showing Fowey Rocks all the way to American Shoals, so basically Southeast Florida and the Florida Keys. But maps and charts further back in the day 
weren't really as detailed or even accurate. And there really weren't even that many maps or charts available. There were a few that were manufactured in Spain and a few produced in Great Britain, but the further back you go, the less helpful they really were. And so before maps and charts, there was navigation that relied simply upon using five senses. And I know people who have navigated on the water using this tried and tested method of closing one eye and wiggling their thumb or one of their other fingers back and forth. And this, this came from what ancient, well not ancient, but more historic long-term explorers did. And that was using their eyes and using the positions of the stars to navigate. And this is pretty impressive. And I certainly couldn't imagine even attempting something like this, but this is how they got around. And so I want you all to just have this in the background of your mind because this largely informs the history of sailing and shipping in the last several hundred years. This is a Google, Google Earth shot of Southeastern Florida. And the Straits of Florida are important. The Straits of Florida are, a, excuse me, a reversed L-shaped trough that separates Florida from Cuba and the Bahamas. And its southern arm opens westward into the Gulf of Mexico. And the northern arm opens up into the Atlantic Ocean. And please note that these arrows are simply just for visual reference only. Please don't take them to try to navigate or anything. They're just so you can get an idea. And the open that northern arm of Florida Straits opens up into the Bahama platform. And Spanish ships utilized this area extensively after Ponce de Leon discovered the Straits of Florida. And it became the preferred route for ships returning to Spain. And this approximately 80 mile passage between Key West and Havana, Cuba was used to travel. It was the most direct route from the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean and vice versa. And some of you all might be familiar with the body of water known as the Gulf Stream, which is a current that begins off of the dry Tortugas and continues northeastward as it travels up the coast of our state. And it starts to move more quickly as it squeezes through tighter areas. And this was really critical because ships traveling, whether to Europe or from Europe, would try to avoid the Gulf Stream because its, it's predominant direction is northern flowing and it, it can change. But either way, you don't really want to get, you wouldn't want to get caught in it because that could make your navigation and your trip much more difficult. And so the sailors would be trying to hug the coast of Florida as much as possible, but unfortunately that came with a great amount of risk. And why the risk? Well, because we have Florida's coral reef, which has also been referred to as the Florida Reef Tract or the Great Florida Reef, and it's the third largest barrier reef in the continental United States. And you can see this here with my crude outline. Again, not quite to scale, but this is about 350 linear miles of reef that starts off the Dry Tortugas and continues all the way up to Martin County. And in the areas further south, in particular, as you start getting towards Key Largo and south of there, the reefs look a lot like this, where they come up into areas that are quite shallow, very, and whether they're far close to the coast, you can see how prominent they are. And so lack of navigational aids, no true guides and constantly changing conditions and storms and currents really affected the way that shipping happened in these areas because they were that resulted quite often in ships running aground or wrecking. Now, for our purposes, you, you'll, you might hear the term wrecking or racking. It, for our purposes, a wreck is referring to a shipwreck and wrecking or racking is, is the art or business of the marine salvage industry. And wreckers were individuals who came across vessels in trouble and salvaged the items that were aboard them. 
And the original wreckers were the Calusa Indians who took what they needed and often killed the sailors. So a slightly more violent approach. And the wrecking done by the Calusas ended in about 1763 when the remaining populations of them were taken to Cuba and then enslaved. Other wreckers eventually included turtles, excuse me, not turtles, turtlers and fishermen from the Bahamas and later people, sailors from all around the state. And eventually it became this very well organized and systematic legal business where the wreckers salvage the cargo and if possible, the ship and often helping to refloat the ship. And in return, the wreckers customarily received about one half of the salvaged goods. And this included anything from textiles to other supplies, things that were common in that time. And for a period of about 100 years, wrecking captains and vessels in the Keys had to hold a license issued by the federal court. And in 1858, there were 47 boats and ships licensed as wreckers. And there are some, there are some comments throughout the historical records that wreckers were hardly better than pirates, and sometimes they set ships on fire or even intentionally lured ships off course to force them to wreck and therefore take advantage of the situation. But by and large, it seems highly likely that most of the wreckers were doing an honest day's work. And so this is really important because again, thinking back to what we know about the water, I mean, now if we are anywhere near water and we look out a window, we can see a sign, we can see some sort of buoy and that didn't exist during this time period. And so subsequently the rate of wrecks were increasing. And by the early 1800s, wrecks were occurring about once a week, but by the mid 1850s, as shipping and commercial traffic increased, the wrecks were happening at about the rate of once a week. And this uh, study by Tillman showed that there were over 500 vessels that wrecked in the 1850s alone. And so reflected on the slide here, you can see that the revenue that was created by this industry was pretty substantial. And there was a great amount that was recovered as a result of the salvage. However, wrecking is still generally not a great thing because there is loss of vessel, there is loss of revenue, there is loss of goods. And so the response to this was that the US government started to develop more aids to navigation. And I'll mention this again later, but the importance of the wrecking industry started to turn downwards in the latter half of the 19th century as the construction of these navigational aids was becoming more common, as well as the introduction of the steamship instead of a sailing vessel. Now this timeline I'm about to show you is simply a, a grouping, if you will, of some of the highlighted points throughout history. And there's definitely a lot of slightly different aspects and different names for the same thing. So I'm gonna be presenting the most common pieces that I uncovered throughout the research. And the first piece was that in 1789, Congress approved an act for the establishment and support of lighthouses, beacons, buoys, and public piers. And this was later followed up in 1807 with the establishment of the office of the United States Coast Survey. And the Coast Survey was born when Congress called for accurate charts of the coast and, ad and adjacent waters. And the, excuse me, the Coast Survey was a process that took more, more than 40 years to accomplish. In 1852, the US Lighthouse Board was established with nine members present. And then following this, in 1910, the US Lighthouse Service was created. This has also been referred to as the Bureau of Lighthouses. And that was the first Public Works Act of the United States Congress. And it authorized the transfer of existing lighthouses from the jurisdiction of individual states to the federal government. And then lastly, all of this merged 
into what became the responsibility and jurisdiction of the US Coast Guard in 1939. And so that we're all on the same page, I'm gonna give just a few definitions of some common nautical terminology. So we're all, we know what we're all referring to as I continue. And the first is a light, which is simply referring to a lamp or a lantern. Then a lighthouse, which is a tower or building for guiding ships. A light station is one or more buildings on a manned light site. A day mark is simply a daytime identifier of an aid to navigation, whether it's a beacon or a buoy, and they're distinguished by their design, shape, and color. The lantern or lamp room is the glass enclosed room on top of the lighthouse that contains the lens. And then the watch room, which is the room where the keeper stands watch, which is has typically been located just below the lantern room or beside the tower entrance. And that brings us to what is a light keeper? The lighthouse keeper is the person who is in charge of keeping that light, that, that that station, that structure illuminated so that it would be able to help the mariners sailing in the ocean. And the majority of these who served were older white men. In this picture, this is Walter Roberts, who was the keeper of the San Blast Lighthouse in Port St. Joe, Florida up in the Panhandle. And even though the majority were men, there were a good number of women who served as lighthouse keepers. And in this photo, this is Barbara Maberty, who was the keeper of the Key West Lighthouse for more than 30 years. And the women usually came into the role as a result of being married to a keeper or being a daughter born into a lighthouse keeper's family, and then they assume that position. And one of the most famous female lighthouse keepers of all time is Ida Lewis, who was the keeper of Lime Rock Light Station in Newport, Rhode Island. And she was the keeper there for almost 40 years and became the head keeper in 1879 and received the Gold Saving Life Medal in 1881. Now you might be asking or thinking to yourselves, what do you mean Gold Life Saving Medal? Well, in addition to signing an oath to becoming the light keeper, these light keepers were responsible for, as I mentioned, not just keeping that light lit, but also being a watch person and helping to keep vessels safe on the water and respond to emergencies if needed. And their roles were incredibly specific. They were very detail oriented that their duties ranged from keeping the wicks well trimmed before they actually lit the lantern keeping the oil reservoirs full, keeping the glass, the windows of the lantern room clean from dust and smoke and any other, any other contaminants. And this often involved working both day and night, 365 days a year. And so because that expectation of providing assistance and first aid was part of their job, you know, this was, it was not an easy job. It was lonely, it was, demanding and it's sometimes dangerous. And uh, the main reason that we know a lot of what the lighthouse keepers did is because they were required to keep a handwritten log of their, of their daily roles. Today, I'm gonna to be highlighting three of the lighthouses that are off of Miami-Dade County. And they include Cape Florida Light, which is now located on the southern, well, now and then located on the southern tip of Key Biscayne in what is now known as Bill Baggs Cape Florida State Park. Fowey Rocks Lighthouse, which is located now in Biscayne National Park. And the Boca Chita Lighthouse, also located in Biscayne National Park. And as you, I just want you all to take a moment and just look at these images and just take note of how these lighthouses are similar or different because we're going to be discussing their their architecture and why that played into their usefulness or their lack thereof. 
I'm going to jump out of chronological order because I want to talk about the Boca Cheetah Lighthouse, which is really more of an icon and fixture from a cultural resource standpoint, not so much a mariner standpoint. And Boca Cheetah Lighthouse sits on Boca Cheetah Key in what is now Biscayne National Park. And this island was purchased privately in 1937 by Mark Honeywell, who came from the Midwest and had a winter home in Miami Beach. And he purchased this island to be his, his getaway, his vacation retreat from his winter home. So if you're re reading between the lines and you're assuming that Mark Honeywell was probably very wealthy, you are correct. And he built this place for he and his wife and built a number of structures on the property, including this lighthouse. And the lighthouse is built out of Miami Oolitic limestone and is about 65 feet to the top. It's conical or cone shaped and it's 21 feet wide at its diameter. Now it looks great. It's like I said, it's widely recognized. It's actually on the cover of the Biscayne National Park map that you would receive if you visited the, the headquarters in Homestead. But while this unit is here, it's recognizable, it looks like it should work. The absence of hardware in the lantern room suggests that it was never actually intended for use as a navigational aid. And there are a couple of urban legends saying that the Coast Guard shut it down because it wasn't working, but it couldn't be working when in fact it was never designed to do that. But because this island has so many elements that are of substantial historical and cultural value, the lighthouse and several other of the buildings, including the chapel, the picnic pavilion, the engine house, the bridge, the cannon, the stone wall, and a few others, all comprise their considered contributing structures to the Boca Chita Key Historic District, which was listed in 1997 on the National Register of Historic Places. And I like this view because it gives you a really good, a really good, well, to be repetitive, I apologize, a view of Boca Chita Key looking southeast. So you can see that the lighthouse here is at the northern entrance of the harbor. So super cool, but built more for bling than it was for function. And while this is a really good view, I want to say, please don't try this at home. This is footage from a drone. And I'm sure the user probably did not know that, but drones are not permitted in national parks. So please do not use a drone in a national park. So now we're going to jump backwards in our timeline and talk about Cape Florida light. And if you remember what I spoke about a few moments ago, given the, the substantial history of the wrecking that was occurring on the Florida reef, it was decided that Cape Florida needed to be constructed to try and warn ships of the reef. And it was the first lighthouse built for this specific purpose. All of the other lighthouses that existed at that time were guiding, were illuminating harbors. And this was designed to warn mariners of the reefs that were just offshore. And so the number of shipwrecks as well as piracy that was happening prompted Congress to set aside first 18, excuse me, $8,000 in 1821 and an additional $16,000 in 1824 to build this light. And the bricks that were used to build it came from demolished building, buildings in Europe and North America. And you'll notice that these photos, in these photos, this is also a conical shaped structure. The main light is not white. That came later during a restoration project. But again, remembering what it was like in the 1820s, you know, a building project of this scope and scale was pretty huge there were not painters and structures in which anyone could paint the, the light white. So this was its actual original color. It is South Florida's oldest structure and it was first lit by its keeper, John DuBose on December 25th, excuse me, December 8th, 17th, 1825. 
one of the probably one of the most notable events in South Florida's and Miami's history was the attack on Cape Florida that occurred in 1836. The Second Seminole War had begun in 1835 and no light stations or lighthouses had been attacked yet, but many people felt it was only a matter of time. And keeper John DuBose took his family to Key West. He vacated the area and went to Key West to try and wait for protection. And he left behind his assistant keeper, John W.B. Thompson, and another man who was a former slave who was also who lived on the property, a black man who some records refer to as nameless and others refer to as Aaron Carter. And Thompson and the gentleman we'll refer to as Carter volunteered to remain at the tower while help was sent for. However, on July 23rd, 1836, the Seminoles attacked Cape Florida and there was a ton of fire and Thompson and Carter ran for cover in the Cape Florida lighthouse and they locked the door and they were both severely wounded. And unfortunately, Aaron Carter died from these injuries and Thompson became trapped in the lighthouse because he climbed the wooden stairs to the top and the Seminoles set the stairs on fire. So he became stuck there. However, it seemed that the Seminoles thought that they had accomplished their task, which, so they backed away, they then abandoned, they finished what they had started. And Thompson fortunately survived and was rescued because the Seminoles retreated. And so this is, um, this is an event that is just really interesting, but quite tragic at the time. And it destroyed the lighthouse. The lighthouse and the cottage were, did not really, <laughs> they did not survive the attack. And so due to the pressing threat of more attacks, the light was not immediately rebuilt. And I'm gonna interject one piece of really important information. And that is during this time as at, before Cape Florida was built, there was a French physicist named Augustine Fresnel who revolutionized the ability to magnify and concentrate beams of light emitted by lamps. And he created a compact composite lens that became known as the frontal lens. And some sources have referred to it as the light or the invention that has saved a million ships. And these photos show what a frontal lens look like. In fact, the photo on the right is actually the original frontal lens that used to be on top of the Carries Fort Reef light station. And this is on display in the History Miami Museum if you get the chance to see it. And I particularly like this image because the person viewing the lens it, it gives a good sense of scale with just how ginormous they were. And the frontal lens is referred to by its quote order. And that's simply referring to the size and the focal length of the lens. So a first order lens is the largest size and focal length. Second order would be the next largest. And this continued all the way to an eighth order lens, which is the smallest size and focal length. And this is important because the size or the order of the lens corresponded with their price. So a first order lens at the time cost around $5,000, which as you can imagine in the 1800s, I mean, $5,000 is not a small amount today, but that was a much larger amount at the time. And so this, these prices were factored into the decision-making when Cape Florida was rebuilt. And so following some of the work that was happening on the site in 1838, two years after the initial attack, a military fort and hospital were set up at Cape Florida. And in 1847, just over 10 years, the lighthouse was rebuilt and the height was extended 35, 30 feet to make it about 95 feet tall. However, after it was built and relit in 1847, it was a fixed light and only had a range of 13 nautical miles and mariners complained that it still wasn't sufficient to illuminate the reefs. And so Lieutenant George Meade suggested that as it continuously was being rebuilt, the light should be made as high as possible. 
hence the, the extension of the height, as well as installing a frontal lens. And so a second order frontal lens was added in 1856. And so the new height was about 100 feet before sea level. And so this Cape Florida continued functioning for about another 20 years until it was superseded by Fowey Rocks Light, which we will talk about shortly. And from a conservation standpoint, there were a lot of things happening in Miami as Cape Florida was rebuilt and relit. And by this point, the Rickenbacker Causeway had been established. So now there was a road, a bridge connecting main Miami, the mainland Miami with Virginia Key and Key Biscayne. And so there was a lot of concern that development was imminent on the islands. And that brought Bill Baggs, who at the time was an editor of the Miami News, and other concerned citizens to spearhead a campaign to preserve the lighthouse as, 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 excuse me, as a historic landmark. And in 1965, the Florida governor, Hayden Burns, announced that Cape Florida would be purchased from the current owner. It was privately owned by a Cuban named Jose Aleman. And once that purchase was complete and additional land acquired, the approximately 900 acre area became Bill Baggs State Park. And so in 1978, after it was a state park, the Coast Guard activated the light again, which ran for about 13 more years until Hurricane Andrew, along with many other things, knocked the light out of commission. And in 1996, about a $1 million restoration project took place restoring the tower and the cottage. And now Cape Florida is serving as a private aid to navigation. And this restoration project was a really big deal. And one of the large proponents of it were, was the Dade Heritage Trust and the executive director at the time likened Cape Florida. She compared Cape Florida to Miami, similarly to what the Statue of Liberty is to New York City. That was her that was her comparison and it seems like it seems like those two things really do go hand in hand now our final lighthouse that we're going to discuss is fowey rocks light and as i mentioned this was built because there were still quite a lot of complaints that cape florida really wasn't out there on the water that the reefs weren't appropriately lit so this was built around five nautical miles offshore, actually on the reef tract. And its original cost for construction was about $163,000. So again, very expensive, a height of 125 feet. And the lamp that was installed was a first order fr frontal lens. And if you all remember from a few minutes ago, I asked you to compare the different designs of the lights. And if you just take a quick look at Cape Florida, you'll notice it's constructed of brick and conical shaped. And I'm just gonna ask Ed, I'm gonna ask you all to type, oops, type into the chat very quickly, why you think this wrought iron skeletal type of design might have been the design of choice for an ocean side light. Just throw your guesses into the chat and I'll have Ed tell me your guesses. No, no wrong answers. So Elizabeth says because the ocean is a cruel mistress. Hmm. <laughs> Elizabeth, that is a perfect, yes. perfect descriptor. Yes. And Marcia says I, I did think iron would rust. Um, Richard says to allow wind to pass through the structure. Yep. Yes. So there is the concern of rust, but the main reasons, I mean, iron was one of the most widely available materials at the time, but this design was really, this is really to allow wind and waves to run through, to move through the structure, giving it a little bit more stability and improve, improving its resilience, even though that wasn't really a word at the time that was being used, but allowing it to withstand the really difficult conditions of being 
exposed in the open ocean. So you guys were all right on, right on it. Great job. So this is known as what is, this is known as a screw pile lighthouse and screw pile is simply referring to these wrought iron poles or pilings, which were drilled and installed into the seabed. And sometimes this was going through coral reefs. Sometimes the coral reef had to be demolished first, but essentially drilling through rock to install this. So a little bit different approach versus the other two land-based lights that we've looked at. And Fowey Rocks, its very first keeper was John Fro, who was the final light keeper at Cape Florida. So when Cape Florida was decommissioned in 1878, John Fro and his family packed up and got in a boat and made their way into the ocean to serve at Fowey Light. And this site was named like a lot of the other light stations for a shipwreck that had, that had suffered or that had perished in the area. And in this case, Fowey Rocks Light was named for the 1748 British warship, the HMS Fowey that had sunk on the reef there. And so Soldier Key, which is also part of Biscay National Park, about four miles west was the staging area for the materials as well as where the construction workers set up camp and stayed. And Fowey Rocks Light was a little late to the game just in terms of what had already been constructed throughout the rest of the reef tract. It was the fifth of what became known as the reef lights following Carey's Fort, Alligator Reef, Sombrero Key and the Key West Lighthouse. And it had, it went through, it experienced its first hurricane three months after lighting, which was in September of 1878. And this one out of all of the reef lights was declared the most challenging to build. And that was likely due to the, the really rough conditions and being so far offshore. And in the case with Fowey Reef, Fowey Rocks Light, the reef, part of the reef did have to be demolished to build the first, to build the platform to hold the materials and drive in those iron pilings, which were installed 11 feet into the seabed. And a really interesting fact was that as the construction was happening, the construction crew witnessed a shipwreck coming in really fast and ground on the on the reef in front of them and sank. And that was the shipwreck of the Aratun Apgar, which the, the remains of the wreck are still there and they're marked with two mooring buoys. And that happened just east of the lighthouse just a few months before the construction was finished. And going back to that hurricane in September of 1878, John Fro and his family experienced it at Fowey Rocks. And according to his log, the storm raged for three days, loosening the glass panes in the lantern room and allowing the rain into the lantern constantly. And he also wrote that the eastern door of the dwelling was so strained that one of the panels is almost off and the other one is starting to tear off. But fortunately, Fowey Rocks and the Fro family survived intact. So this light station now carries the nickname of the Eyes of Miami because it's the first light station that vessels will see as they're approaching Miami from the south. And it was automated in 1972 and this followed the suit that really was pushed in the early 1960s which relieved all but a few lighthouses of their keepers. So that position really wasn't needed in the same way. And in 2012, Biscay National Park received the full responsibility of Fowley Rocks Lighthouse. It was transferred from the United States Coast Guard to the Park Service. And there's also now a wind buoy that's administered by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's on the light station, which is a really nifty tool if you're boating and you want to see what the real time wind speeds are out on the ocean. And this photograph on the right shows the original frontal lens of Fowey Rocks, which is on display at the Coast Guard's National Aids to Navigation School in Yorktown, Virginia. And so with the construction 
of all of these aids to navigation, the lighthouses, the towers, the light ships, really started to bring the wrecking industry down to its knees. And the grounding of the Alicia, which was a steamship that was traveling from Miami to Havana, is loosely acknowledged as the end of the wrecking industry. And that was in 1905. And wreckers came from all different areas to assist with the salvage. And even though the salvage was relatively successful and the wreckers were able to refloat the ship, it sank the next day in a really bad windstorm. <laughs> So that is now one of the historical shipwrecks that is located in Biscayne National Park. And the lighthouse construction affected the wrecking industry so much that one, one wrecker was documented as saying, I wish them damn lights was sunk below the sea. So it's clear that they were, they were doing a pretty good job at the ship, the lighthouse was doing a pretty good job at illuminating things. And so as we begin to wrap up, I want to give you all another quick poll question. Ed, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up and just select true or false. And that's Florida has the most historic lighthouses in the United States. So again, please use your mouse to just choose your answer. They are anonymous, so don't worry about whether you're right or wrong, just take your best guess. And we'll, we will reveal the answer after these messages. No, there aren't any messages. I'll reveal the answer in just a moment. All right, Ed, will you please? Like we're good. Great. All right, so according to the National Park Service Inventory of Historic Lighthouses, in the United States, Michigan comes in first place with 104. And Florida comes in seventh place with 33. So the answer to the poll question was false, which I mean, that surprised me when I learned this as well, because given the amount of coastline we have, my immediate thought is we must have more lighthouses than that, but no, that's the number of historic lighthouses according to this inventory. And so because these are such iconic and recognizable pieces of not just Florida, but the United States' culture and heritage, there are a number of pieces of legislation that have been created to help keep them preserved. One of the most notable is the National Lighthouse Preservation Act that was enacted in 2000. And that was a follow-up to the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which the NHPA was created to preserve historic and archaeological sites, and the Lighthouse Preservation Act allowed further protections for lighthouses and light stations. Many of these structures are now located within all sorts of protected systems, including state parks, national parks, and marine sanctuaries, so they are afforded protections as a result of being part of those systems now. And here in Florida, there are two nonprofit organizations specifically dedicated to the preservation and conservation of these structures. And they include the Florida Lighthouse Association and the Florida Keys Reef Lights Foundation. And while the Coast Guard still operates most lighthouses, there are opportunities in which they are trying to transfer, transfer the power, if you will, to other groups. And they're, so they're in, in essence distributing these lighthouses to local and state governments as well as nonprofits. But they there is a pretty rigorous application process in which the interested parties have to convince the government that they will be able to maintain the structure and not make any changes that would alter the historic state of the lighthouse. So that's quite a lot to, to, to take on, but a really interesting proposition. And so I wanna wrap this up saying by, there are about 1300 miles of coastline in Florida. And these lighthouses made it possible to more safely explore, trade, work and settle in this state. And they remain icons and destinations and some of them are still functioning aids to navigation. And here in Miami-Dade County, there, there are opportunities to view these three lighthouses 
in particular, and through that's through an opportunity with the Biscayne National Park Institute, which is an educational group that supports Biscayne National Park by enabling the opportunity for ecotourism. And there are lighthouse tours that depart from the Deering Estate one Saturday of every month that visit Boca Chica Key, Cape Florida, and when weather conditions allow, Fowey Rocks Lighthouse. And those are ranger led, ranger led or expertly led. And it's a pretty comprehensive program, a three hour tour or maybe four hours, but it's a fascinating program. I've been fortunate to participate in one myself. And so I highly recommend those more better in the summer months. And I encourage any of you who might be interested in learning more to investigate some of these resources. There are a number of really wonderful books written about the subject, especially in particular to South Florida. And if you visit any of the Miami-Dade County library branches, in addition to their regular historical section, they all have a Florida specific section in which a lot of these books are housed. And so some of the ones that were really fascinating were the top one on this list, Lighthouses of the Florida Keys, Lighthouses and Keepers, and the Florida Lighthouse Trail. I mean, they're all wonderful resources and this is just a sampling of what is out there that covers you know, historical records spanning the last three or 400 years. So with that, I would like to thank you all so very much for listening and ask you just to participate in one more short poll. Ed, if you could launch that, and this is simply for us, for Ed and I to be able to ascertain how we did and be able to capture some demographics and attendance for to report up the chain. Please scroll all the way to the bottom and hit submit. There are three questions. The first question is, please indicate your level of agreement with the following statement. I guess the statement, not a question. I learned something from participating in this webinar. The second question is asking how many people in your household are watching the webinar right now. We don't want you to try and guess how many people are on the webinar, just how many people are watching with you, if at all. And then where are you viewing the webinar from? Are you in Miami-Dade County? elsewhere in Florida, elsewhere in the US, or elsewhere around the world. And with that, we'll leave that up for another minute. Oops, I will thank you all very much for joining us once again, and ask you to type your questions into the chat box, which Ed will be moderating. All right, looks like we got everyone with that poll. Thank you guys. And thanks, Anna, for a great presentation. Um, so it's now 12.30 or a little past 12.30. Um, so if, if you have to leave, that's that's perfectly fine. Um, and again, please, uh, any questions that you might have for Anna or for us in regards to the webinar series, you can go ahead and uh, enter those into the chat. Those will get sent to me and I will go ahead and read, start reading those out. Um, so I did have a few, Anna, um, from earlier in the presentation. Um, so when you were talking about uh, Fowey Rocks, um, we did have a question from Marsha in regards to how deep is the water there surrounding the lighthouse? Oh, that's a great question. The water there is actually pretty shallow. It's anywhere between 10 and 12 feet deep, depending on the tides. So most of these lighthouses that are the Florida reef lights, they're constructed in waters that are pretty deep, which, which makes sense just from a logistical standpoint you know, this is a really big undertaking. So these folks are working from boats and a platform, a temporary platform that they've constructed. So, you know, the tools and the technology were limited to try and build something. If it were any deeper than that, it would have really been a challenge. And you can refer to a, a good example of this is if anyone is familiar with Henry Flagler's construction of the Florida East Coast Railroad, that he was really challenged by some of the deeper water passages in the Keys and that was that became a really hefty hefty project. So all of the reef lights are in 15 feet of water so or less. Great, thanks. Uh, so I had a question from Angela. Uh, did lightkeepers raise school aged children on on premise like on the on the lighthouses? Mm -hmm. 
You know, Angela, I'm not entirely sure. At Key Biscayne, Bisc at Cape Florida, I believe so, because they were right there on land. I'm not as sure about how that worked with those keepers who were stationed on the reef lights, but that is something I can definitely find out and follow back up with you. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think we might have a couple of local lighthouse experts who are on this webinar. So if either of you all are present and I'm referring to John and Liz, if you happen to know that, please go ahead and chat it to Ed. I'm, I'm just not familiar with the school children. All right, we'll move on to a question from Anthony. Uh, so he was, when we were talking about wrecking, um, you know, he has some uh, marine mammal friends. He works at a marine mammal facility uh, or uh, is familiar with one down in the Keys. And there's a dolphin down there named the Atocha. Um, uh, Anna, are you familiar with a wreck maybe that was sunk in the Keys with that name? Do you think that's maybe where that name came from? Yeah, I am familiar with it. And I'm pretty sure, Anthony, that that's, that that's why your, your dolphin friend has that name. All right. Uh, Richard asks, how were early lighthouses powered prior to the use of electricity? Ah, great question, Richard. If you remember from the, the slide with some of the terminology, there was the mention of the lantern. And if any of you all ever did any sort of camping or you know fun activities where you really couldn't, there wasn't the ability to rely upon electricity, what might you have used? And that was a lantern, which was often lit by an apparatus, whether it be a candle or something else, or oil that was powered by a wick. And so that was part of the lighthouse keeper's job was to keep that wick trimmed in the same way that if we buy a pretty candle, the directions will say, trim the wick in between use so that it burns the best and it burns the cleanest. It's the same kind of idea. They were using a wick that was burning the lamp or the lantern powered by oil. And there were lots of different types of oil that were used at the time. So that was how thing, that's how the lights were illuminated prior to the lantern, or excuse me, prior to the frontal light, the frontal lamp. Great. Well, we have a lively chat. We have some good answers to some of the questions that were posed. So um, I'm gonna go, so Anthony, um, if you want to find out more about that wreck, the Atocha, um, Mel Fisher has a great museum in Key West. Yeah. Uh, Mel Fisher Historical Museum in Key West. Um, they have all the information about that. Um, and then uh, in regards to Angela's question on the school age children, um, one of our uh, lighthouse experts, John Owens, says there were no children at FAWI. Um, so we're um, positive about that one, but not sure about some of these other lighthouses that we referred to here. But I would assume again, you know, a lot of these lighthouse keepers were solo, um, you know, in their in their duties there on the lighthouse. So yeah, thank you for that, John. I knew you would yeah. know. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Oh, no, I had something that I had um, I had read recently. Maybe you have some um, knowledge uh, just by doing some of the research here. But on some of the lighthouses that we have down in the Keys. Um, I, I saw recently that the Coast Guard was looking for buyers for these lighthouses um, to, you know, some of the ones down like Alligator and K Carries Fort. Yeah. Uh, do you have any, do you know any other information about, you know, what that initiative, you know, really is like? Is it the Coast Guard just isn't able to manage those anymore? I'm not sure if it's a funding thing because it's, it's my understanding that most of those aren't still operating, that most of them have been decommissioned but there is a group and it's listed, let me go back. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. Here it is, the Florida Keys Reef Lights Foundation. Mm -hmm. That's a nonprofit group and they are very strongly dedicated to the preservation of all of the historic reef lights. And so I know that they've been heavily involved. They've actually raised money. Well, according to their website, they've raised money that helped contribute to some of the restoration work done at Fowey Rocks, but they are trying to buy, I believe the Sand Key Lighthouse. And so I'm not sure if the Coast Guard, if they're turning it over because they're either understaffed or underfunded, 
But as I mentioned, they're, they are trying to give the opportunity to transfer the power, if you will, from the Coast Guard to local governments, whether it be state or county or municipality governments to take on the responsibility and the care of these, these, uh, these historic lighthouses. So okay. if you look up the Florida Keys Reef Lights Foundation, they have quite a bit of information on their page as well as the current status of funds that they've raised to try and uh, assume or purchase at least Sand Key, the lighthouse at Sand Key. Okay, cool. Thanks for that, that info. Um, so Jan would like to know in regards to, um, you know, fueling those, those lights, did they use the oil? Did that come from, from whales? Uh, oh, you know what? I don't have it in front of me, but I believe I believe some one of the oils was a whale source, and I can't remember if it was sperm oil. And forgive me that I'm blanking on that right now, Jan. But yeah, some of it did come from whales. But as new and better sources and more readily available, and you know, more affordable sources of oil came, those displaced the products, the animal products, for the most part. Great. And then uh, John would also like to uh, follow up um, on the, the children at the lighthouses. So the, the du DuBose family, the ones that Cape Florida, mm -hmm. they did have children. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, I'm, Key Biscayne was, I mean, Cape Florida was really the, the light was the only thing on the island at that time. So it's possible, you know, those children were either homeschooled or maybe brought out over to the mainland. Right. I guess at that point in time, it was really Coconut Grove and you know, maybe that's really the only yeah. settlement really at that, that, that stage, so. Right. Yeah, thank you for that, John. Yeah, I know John DuBose, I wanna say he had five children. There were a bunch. Yeah. All right, any, any other questions before we wrap up for today? All right, well, if you think of anything else, um, Anna's uh, email is up on the screen. Um, Anna, there was a link that I was going to add, a, a YouTube link to the oh, chat. Yeah. Did you want to tell everyone what that link is oh, for? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Ed. Ed's putting a link to the chat that I found that does a really fantastic and entertaining overview to what historical navigation entailed. And so it's really well done. It's five or six minutes long. It's pretty easy to follow. And so I, I just recommend it, especially if any of this is of interest to you, to, so you can get a better idea of what of what all of this looked like several hundred years ago. And, and it certainly made me be more appreciative of, you know, the technology that we have and which, by the way, I do like a GPS on the boat, but I have used nautical charts to navigate from Miami to Key West more than once. And that is really it's really cool. It's a trip and it's a fail safe because the nautical charts, even if it gets wet, it'll still work. It doesn't need batteries and they're pretty, they're pretty darn accurate. So, you know, that might be considered old school by today's standards, but it's really neat. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we really enjoyed having you back on our conservation conversations and, and thank you guys, the uh, newbies that joined us today. Our next uh, conservation conversation will be uh, on Wednesday, February 10th. Uh, we will be hearing from Sarah Ortiz on manatees. Uh, so we really hope that you will join us for that one. Um, and you can stay up to date with us on our social media pages. Um, we're linked here on the screen um, and we will be in touch soon. And, and keep an eye out for that email with the recording. Uh, in the next couple of days. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you joining us. Oh, I forgot to turn on my camera. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sometimes we do that at the end, I forgot.